Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Kaysen. With me today is our own pianist in residence, Sam Page. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Indeed we are, and we also have a special guest joining us today. His name is Dr. David Schechter. And uh, Dr. Schechter, we, we've been doing a doctor theme lately, a number of doctors as guests on the show. And what we love about the ones we've been bringing on is, is they're willing to push the boundaries of what medical science is usually willing to talk about and to do. And Dr. Schechter is no exception because he is the author of a number of books, including Think Away Your Pain, Your Brain is the Solution to Your Pain, and his whole thing is about the mind-body connection, which we, of course, love talking about around here. Plus, he has a, a particular uh, bit of information about something called TMS. Now, I have to admit, I've never heard of TMS before. I did a look up on it, and it, what I found wasn't the right one because it was trans cranial magnetic stimulation. Pretty sure that's not what he's talking about. So we're going to have to learn more about that. But first of all, Dr. Schechter, thank you so much for joining us on the program. How are you doing today? Glad to be here. Doing well. Thanks. Thanks very much. And you got to give us a little bit of your background. How did you go down this path? I mean, you, you almost went against uh, medical norms here. Oh my God, we're going outside of the, the way things are normally done. Well, I was a medical student. I was a medical student at NYU in New York, and um, I was having knee pain. And I did the conventional things. I went to an orthopedist and I got examined and all of that physical therapy stuff. And I wasn't getting better. So I walked into an office, the office of Dr. John Sarno. Is that a name you've heard by? Yeah, name? sure. All mm -hmm. right. So I said to him, you know, is there some kind of high tech physical therapy you can recommend? My knee's not getting better. And he asked me a few questions about what I had done. And he said, I don't know how you'll take this, but 95% of this chronic pain is psychosomatic, psychophysiologic, mind body. And it was a shock. It was like getting hit with a blast of Arctic air when you were walking down this normal street. But I was open-minded enough to go to his seminar where he educated his patients about this issue and went to the seminar um, and said, boy, this is me. He's talking about me. And uh, it, it made sense. The, uh, I'll explain, of course, in more detail what I'm talking about. But the idea that worrying, the idea that not being so happy as a first-year medical student that all of these things were contributing to my nervous system not getting rid of this knee injury that should have healed a long time ago. And when going home that night, I felt like a weight was lifting off of me. That weight was the pressure I had put on myself to find a solution and the fear that I wouldn't have a solution to my knee pain. Mm -hmm. And slowly over the next couple of weeks, the pain literally went away. Uh, he also examined me in the office to confirm the diagnosis. And that's how it all started. The following summer, I was able to do a research study, got a little grant and was able to spend a summer in his office hmm. calling up patients like myself that he had treated for knee pain and back pain and other kinds of conditions and kept hearing the same amazing stories that I experienced over and over again. And I said, this is powerful stuff. I need to learn more about this and incorporate it into my practice. So that's how it started. That's fabulous. And tell, tell us about TMS, too, because, I mean, I had never encountered that one before. Yeah, so Sarno had to come up with a name for this condition when he was working as the director of rehabilitation medicine. By the way, he's long retired, and he, he passed away a number of years ago. But he called it tension myositis syndrome, later tension myoneural syndrome. He was looking for a name to describe the fact that there's emotional and physical tension involved, that it often occurs in the muscles, myo. And that syndrome means it can it can cause a number of different symptoms. Uh, you mentioned recently that some people have used this acronym for a form of magnetic healing, uh, you know, transcranial magnetic. I call that the other TMS, but the real one is the one we're talking <laughs> about today because it's been around longer. And there's other names for it. Uh, some doctors have called it the mind-body syndrome, keeping with the acronym mm -hmm. but changing the letters or the words. Um, psychophysiologic disorder. PPD is another name, hearkening back to Sarno saying psychosomatic, psychophysiologic, the mind and body are involved. So there's different names for this. Um, I can even give you more names, neuroplastic pain. The point is, though, that the, the pain is real. If you have listeners who are dealing with chronic pain, the pain is real. It's just that when you've been having it for a long time, and when you haven't found a clear solution from the alternative and conventional approaches that are employed by physicians, chiropractors, acupuncturists, et cetera. The reason is probably because the pain is stuck in your nervous system, right? It's no longer a 
damage that's occurring to your back or your neck or your knee is that the nervous system is stuck on a cycle. It needs to get out of that cycle. And that's how and there's a treatment program and an approach that I use that Dr. Sarno taught me and that I've expanded upon to try to help people get out of that pain cycle. That's an interesting concept, being stuck in a cycle. Can you kind of expand on that? What exactly does that well, mean? You know, people think about stuckness. I mean, you could be stuck in a bad job. You could be stuck in mm. a, a difficult relationship. You could be uh, stuck in a, at a point in your life where you don't know where, how to go forward. Uh, all of those things in some ways are analogous to what we're talking about because the body can learn pain. All right. So this is an interesting concept, right? Learning pain. Mm. You can learn to hit a backhand better if you practice a lot. You can learn to swim or play the piano if you practice a lot. And similarly, your body can learn pain. So what's the scientific evidence for this? Some of your listeners may be curious about the science behind this. It's Absolutely. Not just okay. So if you do a, a functional MRI scan, if you do a blood flow scan of the brain, this is not the same thing as a structural MRI. It's a functional MRI. It looks at the blood flow in the brain. Okay. If you scan somebody three weeks into a knee injury or an ankle injury or back pain, or even six weeks, you'll see increased blood flow in a part of the brain, which is expected, the somatosensory cortex, where sensations are experienced in the brain. Mm -hmm. No surprise there. Here's what the interesting thing is, though. If pain persists for six or more months and you, and you scan the brain again, the blood flow increase is no longer in that sensory cortex. It's in parts of the brain called the amygdala, the prefrontal cortex, and related areas. And it turns out that those parts of the brain are more intimately linked to the emotional centers of the brain, like the limbic system. And so it, scientifically, we have now a basis for understanding Sarno's distinction between acute pain and chronic pain. Some, some researchers have called this chronification, the process by which a, an acute problem becomes chronic. It becomes stuck in the nervous system because it's now in a part of the brain that is much more linked to our emotional centers, our fears, our worries, our joys. And if we are unfortunately worrying and stuck and afraid of this pain, it will persist because it's locked into that area. So that's one of the ways that I look at the, the science behind saying that the pain is stuck in the nervous system. Yeah. I also talk about neur neural pathways, you know, that people can, you can learn to develop pathways as a result of doing something over and over again. I'm sure your podcast pathways have become very good because you, you host a podcast regularly a lot better than the very first day you did the podcast. Very true. And similarly, if, you, if, if, if you've played sports or musical instruments or anything like that, you know that you get better at it as a result of your neural pathways becoming more in, uh, sophisticated, more wired, if you will. Same thing happens with chronic pain. So Sam knows all about that too, by the way, because he's a pianist. Okay. He, he's actually mm -hmm. a okay. highly skilled pianist. Oh, oh yeah. And I, you know, I get to a point where Obviously, you still have to practice, but it's it's you know you these nerve path these nerve uh, neural pathways are there, they're, they're they, you know they know what to do, and even Absolutely. if you took time off of, of piano, you you would be able to go back there and be very fluid compared to someone who doesn't play. But at the very beginning, it takes a lot of practice to get that fluidity. Absolutely, get and actually, that just made me think of something because with piano, we have something we call muscle memory, but that's probably yeah. linked to that. I would think. Yes, right? I think we, what, muscle memory is really memory implies some type of a learning process yeah, yeah. muscle memory is really nerve memory if you think about it because mm -hmm. our muscles our muscles are really passive actors in the game right i mean you you do something and you develop muscles and strength and all of that but what you do is you fire a nerve that says to the biceps contract or says to the fingers play uh mozart in a a, a flat major or something. Right. <laughs> you know, i'm not a musician but you know you know what i mean so uh, it's it's nerve memory. It's what I'm talking about. It's neural pathways that develop uh, the so-called muscle memory. Golfers describe the same thing. P PNS, any sport that you play, muscle sure. memory. But it's nerve memory, uh, neural pathways. That makes sense. Yeah, because those those neural pathways are not only how we learn; they are how we pattern ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because we are beings of pattern. I mean, yeah. we are, <laughs> and, to, and to a great degree, they benefit us. The yes. exception here is a situation where you combine perhaps an injury, you combine stress, you combine worry, you combine misdiagnosis, fear into this cauldron of, uh, uh, of pain, right? And it doesn't go away because it's stuck and it, it needs somebody 
to diagnose it and treat it correctly, which is uh, what we're going to talk about next, perhaps, or soon. Well, okay, go right to it. Let's go for it. All right. So I start with, first of all, I start with seeing people in the office. Many of them now are seeing me specifically because they want to know if they have this problem because I'm, I'm known as an expert in this uh, chronic pain mind-body area. But I take a, a careful history, and the history is also looking for things that maybe other doctors aren't asking about, like stress in your life, like your childhood experiences as well, because childhood mm. continues to affect us throughout our lives. Obviously, sure. I ask about relationships and financial pressures and other things. I also ask about your personality. So there's a personality type, type T, which is more likely to get TMS, okay? Uh -huh. And so that would be someone who's very hard on themselves, perfectionistic, maybe sensitive to how others perceive them. It's called a people pleaser. I mentioned worrying and also goodest people who want to change the world. But gosh, it's awfully hard to change the world when you're one person, even a thousand people, even a hundred thousand people have a hard time changing the world. For one person, there's a lot of frustration associated with being someone who's very committed to, 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 good, to good work. And so all of these things put pressure on us and this pressure unfortunately augments and perpetuates chronic illness and chronic pain, especially. So I, I ask about personality. I mentioned, I ask about stressors and I'm trying to understand the person beyond just, you know, the, the, the medications they take or very superficial things that doctors often ask. And then I'm examining them. I'm looking for, you know, whether they have a pretty normal exam, whether they have certain tender points in the muscles that I identify as being common uh, findings in, in, in chronic pain. And I, the, the rest of the visit is, is spent on education because education is sort of the penicillin for this condition, right? So the education that a doctor can give you in the office, the education you can get from books and videos, education begins to undo the programming and the patterning that you're stuck in. And then we use a technique called journaling, which is which is expressive writing. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've heard about that from other oh all over the place yes. on the show. It's become very <laughs> much more well known. But there's a tremendous number of scientific articles by psychologists and physicians mm -hmm. showing that writing your feeling, writing about your feelings in a systematic way every day or most days of the week is extremely effective for dealing with uh, psychological and emotional issues. We use it. Mm -hmm. um, in this manner for 10 or 15 minutes a day, either uh, free association or guided journaling. So we've got educational materials, we've got journaling. Then we have, um, depending on the patient, we have groups and individual therapy. The group might be led by myself and a psychologist. I do it on Tuesdays, it's 6 p.m. Pacific. So I'll be doing one tonight in a few hours, oh, okay. nine o'clock Eastern. Um, so we, we do group therapy. We also have individual therapists who specialize in this model. So we've, we've changed a patient who is stuck in fear and worry and not getting better from pain and given them a way out of this, which is education, journaling, understanding, and activity, physical activity. You know, we've got to get them moving again. People with chronic pain are afraid to move. So we get them started slowly, maybe five minutes of walking or eight minutes of walking, you know, build it up a minute or two a day or swimming or um whatever they have available, stationary cycling. And we, we get them moving a little bit. We also use affirmations, you know, it's positive self-talk. I mean, that would certainly relate to this uh, theme of this podcast. We use, you know, there's a lot of negative chatter people have in their head throughout oh, the wow. day. <laughs> we all have it. We all have it Hell to yeah. some degree or not. And people with chronic pain have a lot of it focused on, is this ever gonna go away? Am I gonna get back to my normal life? Will I be able to ever return to swimming? or tennis or whatever they want to do. And so we change that. We give them specific affirmations or help them create their own. There's an app that I've contributed to that helps with that as well. And nice. these affirmations, the, repeating these affirmations, uh, you know, begins to attract good stuff, as you might say in the LOA community, but it's, uh, it's changing that, that negative chatter that we have in our heads. De Debbie in the live stream uh, shared a couple of comments. She said, what, when you were describing the T-type personality, she said, that would be me. And yes, I have TMS. And she went on to say, I think a lot of people like me develop chronic pain disorders like TMS, fibromyalgia, chronic myofascial pain syndrome, et cetera. So she's very excited for this program. Yeah, they're, they're Debbie, you're absolutely right. You know, if you are a type T, you're at higher risk for these things. Uh, 
uh, other associated conditions, you mentioned a number of them would be tension headaches, grinding the teeth and TMJ, mm -hmm. uh, temporomandibular joint pain, um, as well as, you know, back pain, neck pain, uh, sometimes tennis elbow or plantar fascia as well. Irritable bowel, you know, that's IBS is another common condition that's associated with stress and tension and internalizing those feelings as a yes. type C personality. Um, sometimes it's the way we were brought up. Sometimes it's just the way we're, we're made. You know, each of us is a little different. And sometimes people just internalize more of this as I did during medical school. And as so many of my patients have over the years, but you can learn to get better at this. You know, you don't have to become, go from a type T to a type B or C. Uh, meaning you don't have to be a mellow surf bum at the end of this uh, program. You just have to tune <laughs> it down a little bit, right? You have to just tune it down from maybe a nine out of 10 on the you know, nine to 10 out of the perfection scale. Maybe go to eight and a half, right? Instead of being uh, nine and a half out of 10 on the self-critical scale, maybe you go down to eight and a half or seven and a half. You don't have to completely change your personality in any way, even if you could, but becoming more aware of it and tuning it down and changing the messaging from fear to hope, from worry to I can get better is a key part of this. That, that's really a great point that you're making, the idea of trying to just make little changes incrementally rather than trying to make huge shifts, because I think most of us who have ever tried to make a large shift have found just how difficult slash impossible that can be. But anybody can make a little shift. And, and once you learn that pattern, you can really you can accomplish a lot in a very small way. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Um, being consistent uh, and, and persistent is, is really, being persistent is more important than, than a massive shift. Because sometimes a massive shift will then flip back in the other directions where it, is you start moving in the right direction. I mean, I had a woman years ago who was a former uh, personal trainer, you know, used to be in tremendous shape, but due to back pain, couldn't do anything. I said to you, do you go to the gym? She said, I don't even think about going to the gym. I can't do anything. <laughs> so we talked about this. I diagnosed it as TMS. I felt that the problem was real, but it was a benign. It was not due to a structural injury. I looked at her MRI scans and all that. I said, listen, go to the gym for five minutes. Could you do five minutes? She said, oh, of course I could do five minutes. I mean, what is it? I used to do three hours. What's five minutes? So I said, go to, go to the gym for five minutes. And then every other day, add a minute. And let's see what happens. And, you know, she came back to me in a month and she was doing a half hour and feeling strong and good. And she was getting back into it. So sometimes starting incrementally can be a very good way to go. It's also a great way to develop a new mindset because that mind body connection really depends upon your mindset, doesn't it? It's totally about attitude and belief. You know, that's what I emphasize. Attitude is I can get better. This is not permanent. It's real pain, but it's not damage. And belief is uh, I don't have a structural a reason why I, 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 I should continue to have pain. I'm healthy. I'm strong. We emphasize I'm safe. You know, these types of new messaging, attitude and belief really prope uh, put, propels us forward. You know, at, as I mentioned earlier, we've had a number of uh, medical personnel on the program in the last few months, much more than the last 10 years. I've been doing the program for 10 years. All of a sudden this year, boom, we're getting the medical personnel, which is great. I'm loving that. Um, yeah. One of the things that I, I kind of think about a lot, and I'm curious to know what your perspective is on this. On the one hand, I'm seeing more and more people, because I'm doing the podcast, who are medical professionals who are leaning more toward understanding and appreciating that mind-body connection, trying to apply it in their various practices, getting very interesting and exciting results. And, and to me, that that's fascinating and wonderful. And on the other hand, I see like the mainstream medical community that's kind of resistant to the whole thing. And so I, I feel like a push me pull you on the one hand, that's good. On the other hand, it's like, oh my goodness, we're way behind. What what when you look at the situation? I mean, you're in the community and you're yeah. you're part of that community. When you look at that that dynamic, which which way do you feel about? It? Do you feel like we're still kind of stuck? Do you feel like we're moving? What what do you think is happening? Look, I've been in this uh, field actually for a long time doing this TMS work, a long time, um, and I've seen a shift. I've seen improvement. I've seen more openness. I've been able to give some lectures recently at major hospitals, some of them on Zoom. Um, and I see people being more open to this approach. However, there's still tremendous resistance. And the resistance relates to the fact that, number one, who are we selecting for medical schools? 
you know, people who are good at science, not necessarily mm. people who are good at the humanities or the holistic perspective. Mm -hmm. Number two, what are we teaching in medical schools? We're teaching microbiology and we're teaching uh, biochemistry, things that are important, but the behavioral sciences tend to be sort of looked at as like uh, you know, the, the, the weak sister or something. Right. The whole of this. And then in terms of residency, we're teaching, we're, we're selecting people for pain management residencies who want to do procedures, not who want to cure pain. They want to, they want to inject people. They want to do, they want to prescribe medications. They, they're not, they don't want to sit and listen to people, which is what you have to do to heal them with this method. You have to be willing to sit and listen. And the other thing is our reimbursement system in healthcare is based on surgeries and procedures and, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Um, we need to re one of the doctors I work with, uh, who is, was a surgeon is now retired from that, but is doing this kind of work now. He feels we need to re increase the reimbursement three or four times for cognitive services for sitting and talking to a patient Wow! and reduce the reimbursement for procedures if we're going to have dramatic changes in, in healthcare in this country because the incentives are too high. Look, we need surgeons. We need people who can operate on obviously a variety of conditions. But if you think about a hospital and how much money they make off a surgeon doing surgery at that hospital, there's a lot of incentives and a lot of payments going back sure. and forth that are legal, but they are based on a model of uh, intervention. They're based on a model of surgery. The other thing is we talked about journaling and how much research there has been that supports it, mm -hmm. but I've never had a pharmaceutical rep come by and offer me a notebook. I've never had, <laughs> I love it. That would imagine. imagine happen, right? I've never had I, I, Staples. Staples is not sending people out to doctor's offices with, with a notebook, a $3 right. notebook and a pen and say, you should give this to your patients. You know, so whereas pharmaceutical reps are coming out with the latest new migraine medication that costs a thousand dollars a month mm. to quote, prevent and treat migraines. Mm. I've had very good success with a lot of migraine patients <laughs> using this mind body approach. I had a woman uh, in the last uh, year or two who, is a, who was a physician and her husband's a physician, but she had migraine headaches and she was open to a different approach, a little more holistically minded. And she got completely off of all her migraine medicines using this approach and focusing more on stress and all of that. Her husband, who's a physician, still doesn't quite get it. He's still not quite sure how, how it works. He's happy she's better. Sure. Because yeah. he cares about her. But it's like, you know, if your mindset is just stuck in this box, it's very hard to get out of that box. You know, the I wasn't meaning the box in my head. I was thinking of somebody else's box. <laughs> no. no, but it's a good, good way of, of illustrating it because that's some exactly kind of what box. Like. If you're stuck yeah. in that box, you know, you can't get <laughs> Ooh, so, so, there you go. Box, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I um, love that. So yeah, and when I've like I, I gave a talk at a a number of years ago at a uh, an HMO, it's you know, health maintenance organization, right? So I figured that this, they might be more open to this because their incentives are a little different. They're on a salary, right? The, the, the practitioners are not being paid to do more surgeries, not being paid to do more procedures. Mm -hmm. So I gave a talk with a psychologist, both of us experts on TMS. And at the end of the talk, uh, we said, you know, you think this is something you could incorporate or whatever. And I think that they, they basically said, well, it's not really what we've learned to do. And we kind of do what we, we're, we've been trained to do. Yeah. Know? And so they, the doctor has to be willing to be trained in something new. And it has to be willing to explore something new. Schools eventually and stuff, but it's been slow. We had a doctor on, I, I'm trying to remember his name, about uh, three or four weeks ago, who made the point that kind of parallel to what you were just talking about, that when a doctor becomes a doctor, he comes th usually through a particular college or a particular university mm -hmm. with a particular approach to whatever the discipline is that that doctor yeah. engages in. And the way that those colleges and universities carry on uh, their their mandates as they see them is to keep purveying the same information that they've been purveying for 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years, which doesn't actually lend a whole lot of room to shifting and to change and to looking at things from a different perspective, does it? Yeah, there tends to be sort of like a generation teaches the next generation. And then there's, mm. there's new science and things that are added, new medications. But then, you know, they, they, they're, they're keeping the same philosophy going. Right. The other thing that I'll say is that um, Dr. Sarna, who was my mentor, was a clinician, wrote a number of books mm -hmm. and certainly treated, you know, that many, many thousands of patients, tens of thousands of patients. Um, but he didn't do a lot of research. So recently I, I did some research about. Uh, 10, 12, 14 years ago, I had a, a small grant from a, a patient of mine, actually, who, who, who enabled me 
to do a little bit of research. But the more research, and, and lately there have been some doctors, colleagues of mine around the country who've been publishing some studies on this methodology. And so we need more of this research because if there's one thing that can help to crack this very difficult eggshell of, uh, of modern medicine, it's, it's enough scientific evidence that they just can't ignore it anymore. Hmm. You know, if you look back at the history of how uh, science uh, changes over time, they have the books written, the, uh, the structures of scientific revolutions and the paradigm shift. You know, it starts out by ridicule and then it goes to, to anger and then mm-hmm. suddenly it's acceptance, right? It's like, it's, it's right. so, you know, this approach has been uh, at times ridiculed and uh, at times people will, will speak against it. At some point, maybe after I retire, but at some point, People will shift over and go, oh, this was obvious all along. Why didn't we think of this? You know, this is what we should have been doing all along with people with chronic pain. I'm starting to get a little bit of an inkling of that from some people, but there's so many entrenched forces that uh, are challenging. But in the plus, meantime- Plus the money is also pointed that way too, right? I mean, cause, cause, right? because the, the research money, you, you mentioned the need for research, yeah. but the research money goes to where the profitability is. Exactly. I mean, there's not the going to be a whole lot of profitability in this. Yeah, I, I should have added the research primarily goes to pharmaceuticals that you can, if successful, you can get make billions of dollars off of right. as a corporation. The research money doesn't typically go to an app or to a book nope. or to a an online program. It doesn't go to that. So the doctors who've been able to get uh, funding, uh, and one of them is seeking a, a fairly large uh, NIH grant, National Institute of Health grant, that could really push this work forward. But they've had to get smaller grants from uh, different uh, sources that obviously are not pharmaceutical related and that type of thing. But yeah, um, but which is the, good. I'm glad that, that the alternatives yeah. are are available. At least that's a good thing. That's hopeful. Yeah, and as and as and as discouraging as some of what the last five or six minutes have been, I will point out, despite this, there is still uh, many psychologists who do this work in the United States and, and in other countries, there are, uh, you know, I wish there were more, but there's a number of physicians around the country doing this work. I mean, dozens, not not hundreds, unfortunately, but dozens. And, um, you know, there is the, op- and there's books to read and other things you can do as well. So for those who are listening, uh, it is possible to to get help, despite the fact that um, that this method has not been endorsed at this point by let's say, uh, you know, Harvard's Mass General Hospital or whatever. <laughs> Interestingly enough, a colleague of mine who's affiliated with Mass General uh, did publish a study last year with outstanding mm-hmm. results, a small study, and he's hoping to get more grant money. And there was another study that was published uh, out of um, out of Colorado that was also a very, a very pro uh, positive results in terms of uh, the outcomes and things. So it supports what I published years ago as well, that people can get great results with this without medications, without surgery, and uh, really, you know, cost effective compared to other options. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, uh, anyone really can do some research. I've actually done some just yeah. through Google. I mean, we don't have access necessarily to the kinds of medical databases you guys have, yeah. but we can still find stuff. And there is plenty of stuff out there about studies that have been done that yeah. show over and over again, the power of the mind to uh, to heal pain, the power of the placebo effect, the pro- right. power of all these different uh, alternative modalities, study after study. And in fact, I had a researcher on about a year and a quarter ago who is her, her life is almost totally devoted to placebo research, yes. particularly related yeah. to pain. And Fascinating done, subject. Fascinating yeah, subject. she's done a lot of work with that. Yeah, for those um, of you who want to read research, I mean, uh, there's a there's a, an organization, a nonprofit that I'm affiliated with. Uh, one, they have several websites, but nchronicpain.org will take you to their main website, nchronicpain.org. It's a nonprofit. Okay. And they have, uh, there's a, if you click through, there's a space where they have over 300 articles pertinent to uh, mind body psychophysiologic disorder. So it's not like there's any there's not any science. People don't bring it together as, as effectively as this organization has done. But um, it, there, there is a lot of science out there supporting this approach. In fact, this surgeon who's retired from sur- back surgery really believes there's more scientific evidence supporting this approach that we've discussed a little bit today on the podcast, and there is supporting spinal fusion, which is done mm. uh, thousands of cases, thousands of operations a year with, and, and the surgeon will say to the patient, you have maybe a 50, 50 chance of improvement, right, which right. is, I wouldn't roll the dice for a, yeah, that's a scary invasive percentage. operation that could damage me uh, right. for the rest of my life. I mean, unless there were no alternatives, um, there are alternatives. So one, one needs to look at those alternatives uh, before 
I think doing something that that's a, a roll of the dice in terms of that particular operation for a spinal fusion. Now, let me take this a, a little bit further afield in terms of, we've, we've already gone outside of the bounds of what mainstream medicine is comfortable with. Yeah. I, I, I like pushing boundaries, so I'm gonna push it even right. further out. Um, so I wanna take the idea of the mind-body connection and take it, well, I mean, the, the fact that it's been taken into the realm of pain so effectively is really encouraging. That, there's just some really good work work that you're doing, work that others are doing that is just really pushing that, that forward and I love that. But I also want to ask you what, what your opinion is about mind-body where other aspects of healing are concerned, particularly the idea that you, that uh, well, that's what the placebo effect started with. It started with uh, uh, the ability to heal pain, but it has also been shown in anecdotal ways. You don't get a whole lot of research. That's one of the things I've been really kind of frustrated with. You can't find any research on this. But to the small degree that there's a bit of research out there, it's showing there, it, there might also be mind-body power where it comes to actually healing diseases, healing conditions that that are not necessarily pain related. I'm, I'm curious to know what your take is on that. Well, let, let me say a couple of things. Um, first, I'll say placebo is the innate body, innate, innate power of the body to heal, which can be activated by a variety of mechanisms, including uh, sometimes inert substances given by a healer. Uh, historically, that was the only treatment that was available, mm. um, unless other than active herbs that were uh, that med had medicinal value. There's also something called a nocebo that very few people know about. Oh, yeah. So a nocebo is the opposite of a placebo. And a nocebo is a large amount of what's going on in medicine with regard to a lot of chronic pain and other conditions where yeah. people are told, you know, you're not going to get better. Your MRI looks terrible. These are all nocebo kind of comments because they lead to the opposite uh, response. As far as the power of the mind-body um, connection and, and the power of the mind to heal other things, I can speak from... Uh, personal experience, I can speak from what, what research there is. Um, I, I think that when it people say, well, can I, can I cure cancer with mind-body? I don't think you can cure cancer by itself reliably with mind-body, but I will tell you that a lot of very highly qualified cancer centers are incorporating emotional support, psychological tools, and other things in their cancer treatment. They went, And they're doing this I believe because they think it helps the outcome. It helps the result. So I think for something like cancer, and you know, Andrew Weil, the, the author and uh, physician has written that by the time you get to something like cancer, the immune system is, has become unfortunately so dysfunctional, you can't bring it back just by nutrition, herbs, exercise, and, and stress management. You need Western medicine, but you need Western medicine plus to get the best outcomes, right? You know, so. Um, there's been books written that have talked about really defining a healing space for yourself. Mm. So part of cancer treatment shouldn't just be getting a, going into getting an infusion uh, of, a, of a chemical. It should also be setting up a place in your home or apartment where it's really a healing space. Maybe it includes plants like, like this one, or maybe it includes mm -hmm. uh, pictures that are important to you or books. So that is a healing message for your brain. That's a healing message for your body. We know that being outside in nature is very healing, even small pieces of nature, even in a city where you walk by trees or you walk by a little strip of grass, um, I, that's very healing. So thinking of the broader perspective on healing, I think is very important. If you're talking about something like type two diabetes, which is the insulin resistance, not lack of insulin like type one diabetes, type two diabetes is a whole, can be treated holistically with things like you know weight loss, bet, dramatically better diet, like a really low carb diet and um, paleo equivalent kind of diets and things. Mm -hmm. Stress management's a key element of that as well. And stress mm -hmm. interrelates to your ability to follow through on things like exercise and um, you know healthier lifestyle, that kind of thing. I recommend journaling for a lot of people with with stress in general. I mean. I, in addition to chronic pain, a lot of people come to my office, have stress. They just feel stressed and not sleeping well, other issues. So uh, journaling is a, is a useful tool for those individuals as well. Uh, what else did you have in mind when you say, can mind body also cure disease? Well, I was looking beyond pain relief. Pain relief is, yeah. is the number one thing. That's what yeah. all the research, well, most of the research has pointed to. And it just seems to me that we're, we're missing an opportunity with virtually every other kind of medical condition that's out there if we're not including mind-body in it. 
Yeah. So the question is, is it an op opportunity in addition to uh, elements of um, you know, conventional or Western medicine, or is it instead of? Uh, I think it's probably going to be both. I mean, it depends on the person, well, you know, yeah, it's it depending on the, on the doctor. I too. Mean, there, there was a book um, uh, the, the, about the, the mind and the brain. I'm forgetting the author right now. You may, you may be familiar with it. He's from Canada, but he tells this story of a very successful um, Indian businessman, uh, I believe in Canada, who developed Parkinson's disease. Hmm. Okay, so that's a degenerative neurological disease that relates to lack of dopamine in certain parts of the brain. Right. And he had tried a number of different treatments, conventional medicine, things really hadn't helped him much. So he had a lot of tremor and stiffness, which is uh, early to middle signs of Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So the, the gentleman decided to go back to India, saw some of the top doctors in India. They didn't help him either. Top doctors in London, they didn't help him either. And then he went to three hours outside of, of Delhi to some remote rural area. And they had a clinic there and like an Ayurvedic clinic. Mm -hmm. And it involved, um, you know, traditional healing practices of, of Indian uh, medicine, mm -hmm. which includes certain dietary uh, changes, vegetarian diet, um, certain herbs, certain uh, lotions applied to the skin, uh, peanut oil and different things of that sort. And there was some prayer involved. He was not a religious man, but he decided to participate because he felt that he should do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So he did this for two or three months. And this also, by the way, took him away from the intense stress of his job as an executive or running his business or whatever it was. Sure. That yeah. should also be taken into account. At the end of this three months, the doctor who wrote this book reports that his Parkinson's was basically in remission without medication. Did that cure his Parkinson's? Well, he went back to his life. Uh, I think it was in Canada. And over the course of the next three to six months, a lot of work pressure, probably couldn't keep up with some of the healing techniques and things he had learned in, in this Ayurvedic clinic. His Parkinson's came back. So the question you could ask is, was the remission from, you know, taking a break from life and, and, and stress and just was it the healing techniques or a combination of, of what we've discussed so far? Um, was it reconnecting with something that was culturally very powerful for him? Mm -hmm. All of the above. But it definitely had a huge effect on his neurological system, but it wasn't a permanent effect. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he, his choice then is maybe to go back to the Ayurvedic clinic again, but that's a lot of time away from your life and family and all of that. Family could come with him, I suppose. but And or to... Uh, perhaps combine some of the things he had learned with with Western medicine. I'm not sure we got a final resolution in that book on what he decided. I was just fascinated by a non-pain condition yeah. that we feel we we understand biochemically having such a dramatic transformation with uh, this very different approach to the body, the mind, the nervous system, et cetera. As you were describing this, I was reminded of a conversation that I had with my sister-in-law, who recently attained her PhD in statistics. But before that, she was actually pursuing her PhD in the neurosciences, neurobiology, and had done a lot of research, a lot of learning along that line. And, and she was telling me one day about how if you were to take the various kinds of, of uh, ways that we can measure what goes on in the body uh, that we can do within a lab or within a, a clinic yeah. and just kind of hook a patient up to like check everything in a body from the from the brain to a point of injury or whatever, just just get the whole thing lined up and check, you know, everything like the, the circulatory system, the nervous system, the endocrine system, everything, just just check all of it. Just plug the guy, plug the poor patient into all of it all at the same time. <laughs> what you can actually do is you could trace from the moment that that patient is is encouraged to focus on something that feels good to them or focus on something that feels bad to them and trace all those things all the way down to the point of where there's an injury or there's an illness or something like that at some specific part of the body. And from what she was describing, it's like, I think it's a 90 second process from the moment of stimulation in the brain to the moment that you see something going on in the body. If they're focusing on something that they love, that they feel good about, 90 seconds later, they're spotting healing going on in that section. If they're focusing on something that makes them feel scared or angry or frustrated, then it's actually starting to kill off the body at that point. And I'm thinking, that, that's just insane. That's crazy. Have well, you that's going, on, that? going on throughout our, our, our days. You know, it's going on throughout our days, depending on what state we're in. Um, I think that's one of the frightening things about, you know, our modern uh, technology, you know, maybe the phones and the notifications and the apps and the, 
you know, just the the ups and downs of that. Um, mm. And so I really recommend people limit the number of notifications you have because yeah. you, know, you don't need to look at your phone every every 10 seconds. We're having a conversation here and we don't really need to, to look at anything That's other right. than one another and our our screen here that we're talking on. Uh, but um, you know the the experience in the mind that is it felt to be somehow ethereal or imaginary really affects your whole body by the release of nervous system, nerve, nerve energy, and also hormones, you know? Mm. So you're, you know, and that's one of the thing about being in a constant state of fight or flight, which is the adrenal glands are constantly getting pumped to release cortisol, which is not right. good for us to do constantly. It's great to have that if a bear runs after us, or we need to run across the street because, um, Maybe there's a bus to catch, but that's once in a while. That's not constantly. Right. And, uh, you know, our ancestors occasionally have to run from the bear. So they needed that cortisol help to do that. But in modern life, if you're getting that cortisol constantly, that mm -hmm. dopamine rush constantly, it's it's not healthy for you. So, um, yeah, you know, some of these uh, wearables may eventually be helpful in, in, in achieving a the ability to monitor as you said your whole body state in a better way uh, you know heart rate is one way you can do that but it's not it's not obviously the only one mm. uh, and i've been talking to some some companies about some of the things they could potentially add to to monitor stress and there's some companies coming out with products that might uh attach to your body and and, and reduce your stress a little bit you know kind of give you vibrations or other signals that can reduce your stress but ultimately Here's a great way to reduce your stress. Take a slow breath. Yes. And let it out slowly. And I did it probably faster than I would if I didn't want to have a pause on the podcast. But <laughs> taking taking slow breaths, anytime you feel a little tense or when you just want a little break, you know, that really resets the nervous system, right? A slow mm. breath in. Maybe you've heard, maybe some of the doctors have been on have talked about square breathing or four, seven, eight breathing. Mm -hmm. I can mention that to your, your listeners. Uh, square breathing would be, you know, you breathe in for four seconds and then you hold for four seconds and then you exhale for four seconds and then you pause for four seconds. So it right. makes a square. Right. Um, four, seven, eight breathing is breathe in for four seconds. Hold for seven if you can. If it's uncomfortable, do it for six or five. Hold for seven. And then slowly breathe out over eight seconds if you can. And again, it takes, takes a little practice for some people. And if your lung capacity is not there, you start with smaller numbers. But if you do three cycles of that, which literally takes a minute to do three cycles of four, seven, eight breathing, because uh, it takes 19 seconds, you, you feel more relaxed. And there's mm -hmm. scientific support of that, right? Because it stimulates the vagus nerve, the parasympathetic nervous system, instead of the fight and flight nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system that is too active in our modern life and too active when we're tense. And that contributes to chronic pain as well, because a lot of the messages and guidance we're giving people with chronic pain is about feeling safe and secure, less worried, healthy, not damaged, calm, right? We're giving them the messages in one way or another. And that contributes to the balance of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, which is often out of balance in, in modern life and in, um, in, in, in illness and disease of various types. I'm loving this. And uh, Sam, I think you're loving this too. I mean, we're, oh, we're, yeah, we're, definitely. we're, we're hearing messages that we also hear from non-medical personnel, right? People who are coaches right. and so forth. And now yeah. we're hearing it from the medical personnel. And this is like, whoa, what great reinforcement this is. Yeah, this is, this is what people need to hear. And uh, yeah. you're right. There's some coaches doing great work, psycho psychotherapists doing great work. A lot of people mm -hmm. doing good work. Yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, one other thing, you, you mentioned journaling quite a few times. Yeah. I'm going to bring that up because for myself, I resisted journaling for quite some time. And even when I, I sat down to do it um, on, a, on a somewhat regular basis, I was able to do it, but it, it was a struggle. And, and, and one of the, for, in my case, one of the ways that it manifested as a struggle was I would literally cramp up while I was journaling. 
I mean, mm. I'm not talking like 20 minutes in. I'm talking a minute in. All of a sudden, my hand would start to crap up. I, I had something going on there that was just, you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to do that. I finally ended up just yeah. typing instead of writing. With, with okay. My hand. So, yeah, that made, made, made a little bit of a mind-body mind body connection there in terms of that cramping, what that meant for you emotionally. But first of all, look, no technique is for everybody, right? right? If I said to you jogging is healthy, doesn't mean that everybody who's listening should be jogging. Similarly, mm -hmm. I don't say that absolutely everybody in the world should be journaling, but it's a really effective technique. The most effective, according to research, is actually writing it out. Mm. But the second most effective is typing it out. Mm -hmm. And the third most effective is speaking into a recording device like your phone mm -hmm. or another recording. It turns out not to be effective to think it. Ah. Not, not, so, you know, we, we think all day. It doesn't I mean, it doesn't do us a, a lot of good compared to <laughs> 10 minutes of meditation or 15 minutes of journaling. So there's something about getting into a different space with that. And look, some things that we really need and really benefit us are a challenge to get started, right? If, if any of you out listening need to lose weight, that first five pounds is really hard, but you need to do it. Just like some of you who are dealing with stress and pain need to journal, even though it can be challenging. Um, you can also, the other thing is, you know, we don't have to be absolutist about saying it's 10 or 15 minutes. I have people who literally start out with an index card or a post-it note. And I just say to them two or three times a day for 20 seconds, when you just have a break or you have something on your mind, just write about it on a post-it note or an index card. Nice. And, you know, put that in your pocket, carry it home so nobody reads it at work the next day if you're at an office. But the point <laughs> is, even a, just a, a few minutes of that a day is better than nothing. So, right, we're not, I'm not an absolutist on these things. It's better to do, and you mentioned this earlier, it's better to do something than to do it perfectly, right? So they say the, the uh, perfect should not be the enemy of the good. So good would right. be a few minutes. Perfect would be 15 or 20 minutes. But you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to do it every day, but it's a, it's a very good thing. Now, some people like to do it late in the evening when they have a whole day's worth of emotional stuff to process, but there's some people wake up in the morning, the, ha the house is quiet. That's the only time they have to, to really do the journaling, especially if you have young kids or that kind of thing. So they like to journal first thing in the morning about the previous day and about feelings that are coming up after, um, after sleep and all of that. So whenever you can do it, it's good. And again, you don't have to do it perfectly and you can do it in a little card. You could type it as Walt's doing, or you could even record it. Even if you don't listen to the recording, there's a value to recording it, according to research on how the brain works. Is but writing, there value to recording and playing it back for yourself? Well, you can play it back if you want, but you know, writing, even if you don't read it back, still is beneficial. Mm -hmm. And so recording, even if you don't play it back, is still beneficial. So even recording it and deleting it the next day, has a benefit in terms of the emotional expression because for that 10 or 15 minutes you're recording you're present in a different way with your emotions you know you're saying to yourself i'm going to be open now i'm going to just i'm going to talk about things whether they're good or bad or happy or angry or past or present i'm just going to talk about stuff that's uh that's a good thing to do one of the things that we talk about quite often is uh using these various modalities journaling being a modality uh, and using them in a mixture that is appropriate for the person, which basically means trying things out, seeing what you resonate with, what doesn't feel good to you, what you feel like you can do more often. Uh, I'll speak for myself. I think probably the best way to make progress is to find something, whatever it is, that you feel like you can do and do it regularly rather than a one-off kind of a situation. I think you get the best that. results that you way. Know, consistency can be very helpful in terms... If you're looking to change or develop a new habit or a new skill, you know, there's that theory about four to six weeks of doing it mm -hmm. regularly, it becomes entrenched, it becomes a pattern, it becomes part of your lifestyle. So if you don't exercise at all, and you start exercising most days of the week for about six weeks, it will become part of you, who you are. You'll miss it when it when you stop. Uh, yeah. so it could be for anything. If you uh, if you want to read more books this year, you know, start reading 20 minutes or 30 minutes before you go to bed every night or most nights of the week. And after six weeks, you'll go, how could I ever live without a book? I, mean, I like books. You know? <laughs> so whatever it is that you want to get into, it, it does help to make it a consistent pattern and uh, a regular time, perhaps a regular time of the day as well. And I like your idea of having a menu because, you know, I, when I meet with patients in the office or I do telemedicine now as well, I have this resource guide. It's like a menu. And I'll circle and check certain things on the menu that I think are appropriate for them. But I may give them five or six assignments. I'm happy if they do four of them because 
they'll pick the ones that, that fit, feel right for them. You know, the assignment might be reading this book, journaling, looking at this app, watching this podcast and, and this uh, website. Mm -hmm. And I understand they may not get to all of them. Uh, some may do more than I recommend. Sometimes yeah. that can be a problem too, but. Um, <laughs> that can be a problem. That's interesting. Tell me about the problem. Well, if you spend too much time on internet research, in my experience as a physician, it takes people down a rabbit hole because ah, uh, I can see that. as a physician, <laughs> I went through medical school to, to learn what's pertinent and what's relevant and, and all of that. But a, a lay person gets into, you know, that Google medical journal and they just get stuck into a, into a rabbit hole a lot of time. They've diagnosed themselves with some horrible disease or they convince that, you know, they got to do this or that. So a little bit of internet research is okay, especially if it's, you know, assigned by a physician or a coach or a psychologist. But if you start doing too much research, I have found people sometimes get into trouble with that. And it's probably not limited to people who are non-medical too, because I'm thinking yeah. of a story that uh, Sean Aker, the uh, positive psychology spokesman yeah. talks about. He, he talks about how he got a phone call one time from his brother-in-law who was in medical school. His brother-in-law calls him up and says, uh, Sean, I have leprosy. <laughs> <laughs> Because as your medical student, you're studying all this stuff. I mean, you, you kind of have to go down the rabbit holes. Right. With these kinds well, of everybody's things. afraid of monkeypox now. I mean, but honestly, it's, the fear should not be that heavy and not, not that heavy. And uh, there was a patient who went into a colleague of mine's office in Chicago. And another doctor who was there that day, who was a junior doctor, saw this bump, which was really a pimple. Mm. And you know, decided he, she would swab it for monkeypox. And mm. Uh, it turned out that, let's say, the specimen got lost or whatever, so the guy was very upset that he didn't know if he had monkeypox or not. But my more experienced colleague, my my, my friend, saw me and says, you know, this is not monkeypox. He says, I've seen this many times before. This is a, kind of a pimple. It's a furuncle. And a topical antibiotic should get rid of it in three or four days. So obviously the patient was reassured by that, although he wishes the specimen hadn't been lost. But the point was the fear of having something yeah. that was serious or perceived as serious uh, was... Um, was driving that thing. So, you know, a little bit of research can be okay, but sometimes you want to rely on professionals, just like, right. you know, depending on how complicated your tax return is. And I know some people can do it themselves, but, you know, sometimes it's better to just meet with an accountant and pay him the bucks and get the, <laughs> get the tax return done rather than doing it on your own, making mistakes and getting into trouble or having to spend a lot of time with uh, uh, research or IRS agents and things like that. Yeah, I hear you. Sam, as usual, I, I tend to dominate the, the questioning, but uh, I wanted to know, is there anything in particular you wanted to bring up with Dr. Schechter? Not in particular. Um, I did think of one thing. It's just like, it almost sounds like a moot point, maybe like um, mind body with like neurological conditions, because it might be like mind brain or something like that. But I did think of that at one point. <laughs> Well, I use the term mind brain in, in my book, um, you know, kind of to differentiate between um, I say I use mind slash brain because, you know, we, when we're talking about here's here's an interesting one, uh, Sam and and, uh, and Walt. People will say, well, doctor, are you saying it's in my head? And that's that's mm. a that's considered a very pejorative thing to be implying yeah. that something mm. is in their head. But listen, listen to that. Listen to this. This is what I this is my response. I say to them, well. I'm saying that your condition is real. So I don't in any way think that I'm talking about imaginary. But last time I checked, the brain is in our head. Mm. And the brain does all the thinking. The brain does all the responding to sensations. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, you could say that everything is in our head. Because Absolutely. if I gave you an anesthetic right now and your head went to sleep, you wouldn't be aware of anything. And so everything's in our head. So I, I take it that way. It's not that I'm trying to argue with them about, is it in my head or is it not? I'm, I'm trying to explain that everything's in our head but it's really mind slash brain. And there's also the mind hyphen brain linkage. So I use those two different terms in my book, mind slash brain, because I don't know how, where mind begins and brain ends. And maybe it's all exactly the same thing. We'll leave that to the philosophers. But <laughs> mind hyphen brain is the fact that Western medicine hundreds of years ago split off you know, the brain, to go, this is for the psychiatrists and the priests, mm. and this is for the uh, medical doctors and the barber surgeons. Oh. And that was <laughs> a problem in Western medicine is the split because it's all connected. This was Sarno's big contribution is that, you know, the things going on in here, the emotions and the feelings are intimately associated with the back and with other parts of the body. So that's uh, the mind, mind body connection and how it's all connected. But Sam, as you were saying, mind-brain to me speaks to the fact that 
uh, the mind and the brain are are one. Mm -hmm. And however, you know, again, the philosophers and the people who research and think about this have maybe deeper answers to that. But mind hyphen brain, mind slash brain, I mean, whatever you want to call it, that's what is uh, you know driving driving our discussion today and and driving our body and our engine. Yeah. Well, Dr. Schechter, this has been a great conversation. We got to get some information from you though before yeah. you go because uh, right. well, you have a book out there, you got the workbook, you have an online course, you have a number of different resources for people, and probably there's probably at least one or two listeners who want to know how to find out how to reach you. So give people some information. How do they find out about your stuff? Well, my, my website, mindbodymedicine.com will really link you to pretty much anything you need to know, including the books um, on Amazon and the online course. Uh, the two books that I've written that are most uh, relevant to this subject are Think Away Your Pain and the Mind Body Workbook. The, the latter is a guided journal. It's a 30 day guided journal that takes you through a journal, systematic journaling process and Think Away Your Pain explains in more detail the diagnosis and treatment of this condition we've discussed is TMS today. The online course gives you up-to-date video instruction that combines my, my own perspectives and those of a PhD psychologist who's an expert in TMS, Justin Barker. And so you get five hours of material in the course, um, you get five hours of material and, and some downloadable PDFs as well. So you might want to start with the website, maybe order a book. Uh, it's also on Kindle, Audible. I'm the, I'm the reader on the Audible book, so you get to hear my. You read voice. your own book. Good for you. Yeah, oh, I, read, I like that. I read I like the that. book. Uh, it's a it's a good story how I did that, but I didn't feel mm -hmm. anybody else could convey the information because you know it's 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 explaining technical material simply, and mm -hmm. that's what I do all day for a living. But right. a narrator would be struggling with the technical, and therefore would be a professional reader, but not a, a professional explainer. And so right. I'm explaining things. Um, and I give you credit for like, that. Yeah, people like my read. They thought it was a good read. I mean, it's not its not a novel. I mean, if it was a novel, I guess you get a professional actor to dramatically yeah, sure. read it. But for a technical book, it's better to explain it to people. It's a self-help technical book. I think it's so, always better when the author uh, reads his own book anyway. I think there's something, talk about the, the mind-body connection, the emotional yeah. connection. There is an emotional side to that that comes through. I That's think. really interesting. Yeah, maybe in terms of trust and belief, it's important yeah. as well. So you get that from... Uh, from reading it. So it's Kindle, it's Audible, it's um, regular printed book. And then the workbook I recommend, you can either download the Kindle one and then write in a notebook or purchase the book that you can actually write in because it has space for you to write in it. We're moving from a spiral bound to a printed one, but in any event, it'll be it have space to write in it. So those are the main things I would talk about today. I mentioned the nonprofit that I'm affiliated with, the ppdassociation.org, mm -hmm. which is nchronicpain.org. And that has a lot of good resources for patients as well as professionals. If there are physicians who've listened to this who are interested or psychologists, you can also reach out uh, to me for more information. There are courses being given in the related areas that are available for the uh, professionals. So I can discuss with that, that with uh, people offline. Beautiful. But I enjoyed our conversation today. Uh, with with both of you, uh, Sam was quieter, but uh, it's all it's all good. I talked a lot, and but that's um, the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to talk a lot. You're the guest. That's the oh whole yeah, role. To, <laughs> thank you, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate your uh, your openness and and your willingness to try to connect some of the things that I'm talking about with some of your previous guests, and uh, I think that makes it interesting. I, I think it makes it very interesting. And I, I also want to thank you for something too. Uh, this is not something that, that people get recognized for. And I try to make it a point to do so because mm -hmm. you, you obviously have worked with your patients. You, you've, you've worked with the people who you know have read your books and so forth, but there are a lot of people that you've never met or that you've never talked to. You've never seen who you've helped. And you, you like anybody else who does this kind of work deserves appreciation for that. So on behalf of the people who you've never seen, who you'll never meet, who you'll never hear from, but you helped in some way. Thank you for the work that you've done to help them, because that's really, really important. That's I, I appreciate your, your saying that. Thanks very much. And we appreciate you so much. And Sam, as usual, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Small but great contributions. We appreciate Happy that. Happy to be here, always. And thank you to our live streamers. Thank you to podcast listeners everywhere. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.